Hey everyone, welcome to the first uh, book launch event for Fossil Future. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Alex Epstein. I wrote Fossil Future. So sort of the genesis of this event for me was I asked myself a question that every time in my life I ask myself, uh, it my life ends up getting a lot better. So I wish I asked myself this question a lot more, which is what if I could have exactly what I wanted right now? And in this case, it was I was thinking, like, what is the absolute best book launch event I could have? And I, I was walking with my lovely fiance, Cassandra, fairly recently, and I was bemoaning the fact that I had this amazing launch event with Peter Thiel in 2014. And unfortunately, the recording got botched, and I was just treating this as a tragedy. And you know, I thought, wait a second, I know Peter Thiel still. And he blurred my first book, and he blurred my second book. Maybe he'd be willing to do it. And you know, for me, Peter is an ideal person because he's just always a super original person. And I feel particularly aligned with him on this point that he's made so many times about how society has progressed in terms of bits, but not in terms of atoms, in terms of our ability to manipulate nature to serve human needs. And that's really been a focus of my work, that an aversion to transforming nature is at the root of so much stagnation and even regression. And so, you know, Peter was my ideal person. And so I emailed him and he very quickly said, yes, he would do it which was thrilling. And then he said, well, we just need to find a venue. And then I thought, what would be my ideal venue? And I thought, well, you know, I once met Palmer Lucky. We had a Zoom call for an hour, so I guess I know him. And uh, I, I heard he liked Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And I thought, well, like he's got the coolest setup ever. And I'm a huge fan of his because he is somebody who, you know, became fantastically rich and successful at a young age. And instead of just doing random things, he decided to do one of the most difficult and noble things in the world, which is start a new defense company to defend this, this country's future. And, and I just admire so much anybody who does things they don't have to do because they really believe that they're right. And so just who Palmer is, plus I knew the venue would be amazing. I thought, wow, this would be amazing. And he was the most responsive person of anyone I reached out to. He said, like, I'd be happy to do it, just no journalists. He doesn't like journalists, which if you've followed my life recently with the Washington Post, I don't like journalists either uh, at the moment. So no journalists here. And, and we got this. And then I thought, who would be the perfect person to moderate? And I thought through all the podcasts I had been on. And one of the best interviews I'd ever had is with this guy, Chris Williamson, next to me, who's the host of the Modern Wisdom podcast. Highly recommend that. Uh, podcast and I just noticed that when I was interviewed on Chris's show like he read my book in advance he really understood it and he was neither you know too friendly toward me nor hostile like he really could ask questions to get the best out of me could challenge me when he thought I needed to be challenged I thought this would be an amazing uh, person to interview me and happily Peter Thiel so thanks so much to Chris for joining to Peter for joining and to Palmer for hosting us and, and I expected it to be good but I did not expect that in advance we would get a two-hour ride on a Navy SEAL boat to an offshore oil rig, which is what Palmer uh, included as part of hosting us. So a bunch of my friends got to go, and that was just amazing uh, as well. So thank you so much, Palmer, for hosting us. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And let me turn it over to the great Chris Williamson. Thanks, Alex. So uh, we're going to have about 60 minutes of discussion between Alex and Peter, uh, and then we're going to have time for about 30 minutes of questions at the end. So if you do have any burning inquiries, you can hold on to them until then, and we'll pass a mic around, and you'll be able to ask some questions. So I guess first, Alex, your new book, Fossil Future, you're arguing that our use of fossil fuels shouldn't decrease, but actually increase over the coming decades. What's the outline of your argument there? Yeah, so it's, it's a, I feel like in a weird position because what I'm saying in terms of the world should be using more fossil fuels, not less, is considered like the exact opposite of what people think. It's not just a couple degrees different, it's 180 degrees different because we're told that, you know, allegedly the experts think that we need to rapidly eliminate fossil fuel use. And I'm saying not just slow it down or not just eliminate it more slowly, but we need to actually be increasing it. And I think this, the structure of the book really captures how I think it's possible that I'm right and that so many people are wrong. And so the basic structure of the book is framework benefits side effects. And the most important part is the first section on framework. So a framework is a starting structure, just like a building has a starting structure. Uh, so, uh, so our thoughts have a starting structure. And in particular, when 
we're thinking there are three things that are operative that we don't always reflect on. They're what are our methods, what are our assumptions, and what are our values. And my basic premise is that the way we think about energy is caused by a method, an assumption, and a value that are completely indefensible and yet are utilized widely because people haven't examined them. So I'll just say them very quickly, but I think they'll come up more. So the method that we use with regard to fossil fuels uh, is we don't look at the benefits and we what I call catastrophize the side effects. So an example of this is agriculture. Take one of the leading thinkers in our society on this issue, Michael Mann, the climate scientist and activist. He has a whole book on climate and he talks about agriculture, which is a crucial area. But when he talks about agriculture, he only talks about how rising CO2 might impact agriculture negatively. And that's a fine thing to talk about. But he does not once mention the fact that modern agriculture depends on natural gas derived fertilizer and oil based machines. And without those, 8 billion people literally could not live at the level we do today. So this is a catastrophic thinking failure to only look at that only look at negative side effects, and I would argue catastrophize. And you, if you look at the history of, of predictions about fossil fuels, you have all these doomsday predictions. So it's not just fossil fuels are going to cause some challenge, but the world is going to end. So we see that, and we see the ignoring of the benefits. And, and what I say the proper method is, is we should look carefully at the benefits and the side effects. The second thing is assumption. So when we have all this catastrophizing, there's a question of why do we always assume that the world is going to end with fossil fuels or with something else? And I think the root is a false assumption that I call the delicate nurturer assumption. And this is the idea that nature is this delicate nurturing thing that is naturally stable, naturally sufficient, like it gives us enough resources, and it's naturally safe. And then our impact just totally screws it up. So human impact just wrecks nature, and then everything crumbles. And I think we see this with climate. We expect we're going to increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not just going to warm things and have some adverse consequences, but the world is going to end and it's going to burn, et cetera. And I think this comes from this delicate nurture assumption. And I think we need to recognize nature is not a delicate nurture. It's wild potential. So it is naturally dynamic, it's naturally deficient, and it's naturally dangerous. And then the third thing I think going on in energy is values. When we're looking at the world, there's always this question of what, by what standard are we measuring whether the world is getting better or worse? And I think the dominant standard today is we're measuring it as human impact is bad, how much are we eliminating our impact? So for example, the number one moral metric today is eliminating CO2 emissions. That's the obsession of every company, every government, et cetera. It's not like maximizing human flourishing, which I think should be the focus. And so you see this bizarre thing of we're obsessed with every little molecule of CO2, and yet nobody cares at all about 3 billion people using less electricity than a typical American refrigerator. So I think that when I'm looking at the world, I'm looking at it from a human flourishing perspective, and I don't assume human impact is bad and I don't assume that it's going to destroy us, I think human impact is fundamentally very good and it makes the world better. And so I think it's this, this basic framework of looking at the, what I call the full context, benefits and side effects, instead of just looking at negative side effects and ignoring benefits, and having this view that the world is wild potential, not this delicate nurture, and then viewing the goal as advancing human flourishing, not eliminating human impact. I think that is the reason why I disagree. And I believe 90% of differences over this issue are philosophical. And I believe that if you really look at the world from a pro-human, full context perspective, it is obvious that the world needs more fossil fuels because energy is crucial. Fossil fuels are the only way of providing it to billions of people for the foreseeable future. And billions more people need vastly more energy. So I think it's, and, and actually what we find is more energy makes our climate safe. We can talk about the side effects, but the key thing I wanna stress is when you use a, a pro-human framework, it's actually obvious that the world needs more fossil fuels. And so when I go into benefits and side effects, it's really based on that framework. But once you have the right framework established, I think it's very straightforward. Just to touch on something there, Alex, why would there be an anti-human framework? What, what's the reason that there's a bias against that? That is a, a really interesting and deep question. How much time do you have? <laughs> well, I would actually like to know, what, why don't you start on that, Peter? I would like to know what you have to that's say a hard, that. That's a hard question, though. I, I, uh, you know, one of the, it's a phenomenal book, by the way, I um, read over the last few days and, um, and just, uh, you know, sort of a crazy level of detail on all the different, different arguments and it's sort of, it's somehow sort of extremely, um, 
it feels extremely just rooted in somehow reality. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I, one of the, you know, the question I kept thinking in the back of my mind that I don't have a perfect answer to is, you know, why, why this argument isn't obvious to people, um, why the discussion is uh, so uh, non-reality based, um, you know, uh, why, uh, why, you, why we can't even do a cost-benefit calculation, why, we, why do we have a debate where you only talk about the costs and, and, and not about the benefits or, you know, and I, I can come up with, you know, I can come up with accounts of history of how this, how this has gotten deranged, um, you know, that, uh, but, uh, but it is, it is, it is somewhat of a, it's somewhat of a mysterious question where uh, we should be using more fossil fuels, we should be using a lot more energy generally, we should be having an economy that's growing in which there's more prosperity and more human flourishing. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, it's it's always hard to know exactly where we are in these things. And I always believe in the the power of uh, of human agency, but uh, at, at the same time, it feels like we're not exactly uh, winning this debate in a crushing way. And uh, and so there is something very odd about the the the, the merits of the argument versus the uh, um, the the insanity of the of the, of the politics. Um, you know, I, I, I often just to put it put it in you know somewhat somewhat larger context. I often I often think uh, you know I was I was an undergraduate at Stanford in, in the in the late 1980s, um, where I think um, the you know it, probably the most important the best major you could have majored in was computer science, and uh, and um, it was not even an engineering field. It was sort of a, that was sort of for people who uh, who found um, electrical engineering way too hard, who weren't that good at math. That's what you you, you sort of like. It was kind of this. This, uh, this, uh, this, this, this is not that sophisticated uh, major, definitely not an engineering field. Um, but, but in retrospect, all the engineering fields, if you had majored in engineering, that was a bad mistake. I was sort of class of 89, un undergrad. Um, electrical engineering sort of worked, had another good decade, but wasn't great. Um, certainly aeroastro, nuclear engineering, I and mean, these were catastrophic. That was already obvious to people in the 1980s. Uh, but you know, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, you know, all the sort of areas that have to do with um, the engineering, the science, the technology of of, of atoms uh, was um, you know they the, they all sort of went uh, went sideways, and um, and it's sort of a yeah, it's a sort of a strange question when when this happened. I I te like the the narrative I like to tell is that somehow the 1970s was the decade where there was a big turning point uh, where you know. Uh, you know, we landed on the moon in July of 1969, um, and you know, Woodstock started three weeks later. And with the benefit of hindsight, that's the point at which true progress stopped, and, and the hippies took over the country. Um, and uh, and I sort of map, you know, you know, all these different things to you know, um, a shift to, uh, you know, a, a shift from exteriority to interiority, where um, you know, it is, uh, it is, um, it is about. Yoga, meditation, um, uh, you know, and there was, you know, there was a way in which uh, the the world of bits, you know, it can be both. It can be about the external world. Uh, there's there's a lot of it where it's this this alternate internal reality, and somehow um, this escape to interiority um, was, you know, was the thing that 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 happened to to a large extent, and then the the world of atoms became, you know, more and more. Uh, more and more regulated in all these ways, and uh, and and somehow the the uh, the energy field is, is 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 perhaps the one that's the uh, you know the um, the most important single one in the world of atoms, and it's it's it, it's striking how how that's been sort of uh, self sabotaged over the last 50 years. So it seems to me, looking at the last book and at this one as well, that there's sort of two main narratives that mm -hmm. seem to run in. Oh, can, I, can I say one thing about that? Because I'm just... Jump in. Sorry, I'm, I have a lot to say. By the way, I was a computer science minor, so even less impressive than major, and I like meditation. So, but um, <laughs> seriously, the, the, uh, the thing I think of, so you mentioned, um, you mentioned Apollo and then Woodstock, and you know, a big Ayn Rand fan, and she had this essay, Apollo and Dionysus, back then, which was showing the contrast. And I think one, one gift that we have is that when we had this modern anti-human environmental movement emerge, it was actually pretty explicit that people were looking for a new issue 
when communism was failing globally. And the way Ayn Rand put it, and I thought this was really insightful with the new left, is you know, the old left said, we're for industry, we're for progress, and we're for socialism because socialism will get us there. And then it was clear that socialism slash communism got you the opposite, and they had this basic uh, choice. Do you embrace capitalism because you want industry and progress, or do you keep on with socialism because you don't really care about those? And her point was a lot of the left just embraced socialism and rejected progress, and they did it with this issue of environment. But it was an explicit strategy. Uh, and what happened, I think, is that you had the whole, a lot of political machinery and resources went into promoting this very primitive environmental philosophy. I think the core of it is that human impact is bad and human impact is self-destructive. So one is the goal of eliminating impact, it's bad, and then the delicate nurture, it's gonna destroy us. So this view had always existed and certainly exists in various forms and primitive religions and this kind of thing, but it really got just promoted everywhere with all of these allegedly scientific you know, catastrophes that didn't happen. But it was, it was like this primitive philosophy got so much backing behind it that it penetrated the schools and eventually penetrated the media and you know, including the minds of scientists, and it's, it's this huge tragedy. But I think another re a reason why it was successful, not just there were certain bad forces behind it, but because they co-opted the issue of a good environment. And human beings care so much, particularly when we're wealthy, about having a good environment. And the left, the anti-capitalist left, really owned the idea of being for a good environment. But what the, the leaders meant is an unimpacted environment, which is a bad environment for humans. But they packaged together the idea of an unimpacted environment and a good environment. So the idea is if you're, if you're with the green movement, you know, you love beautiful parks and you love clean air and you love clean water, and no one wanted to be against that. And I think one of the failings of the pro-capitalism side was to not link capitalism with a really good environment. And so one thing I'm trying to do in Fossil Future is fix that and say that if you're for industry, you're for a good environment for humans. And I, I, Peter, I really appreciate the compliments, but one of my hopes is that when people read this book, it'll change a lot more than it's changed so far. You know, I, I'd, say, um, I'd say one of the other, one of the other paradoxes is the way, the way I would tell the history of, of energy is that it was towards ever more intensive modalities. So it was from wood to coal, which has more energy per unit, and then coal shifted to oil, which was much more, um, much more intensive. And then the higher intensive things were in some ways actually less impactful on the environment. You don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to cut down a whole forest to, um, to provide the electricity for a city or, so, or something like that. You, you, you need less impact. And you know, in some sense, the, um, the energy of the 21st century was supposed to be nuclear power, which is you know, even more intense, even less impact. And instead, um, you know, it's, it's sort of regressed. Even, even oil to nat natural gas is more diffuse than oil, so it's a little bit of a regression. And then, of course, uh, solar and wind are, are massively regressive. If we, if we think of them in terms of environmental impact, they're, you know, you know uh, to, to produce enough solar panel, maybe you have to panel over the whole half the country or something like that. Or you have, you have all these ugly windmills everywhere, which, which are much more impactful on the environment. And then, of course, you know, as you point out in your book, there are all these places where you know the environmentalists don't want to build solar panel or, or uh, windmills because they're more impactful in a bad way than, than than these other things. So all this stuff, it it you know it, it it weirdly doesn't make sense, and that's why you know a lot of it comes back to, this sort of anti-human philosophy or or, or something like this. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's just gone in very very strange ways. But but just one one final thing. Sorry, Chris, I'm being bad guest. Uh, but the the thing is. Uh, so the way I think of it is that um, is that the purpose of energy is to impact our environment. So it's definitely true that the more dilute forms of energy, the production of a given unit of energy is more impactful. But the consequence of having more cost-effective energy has more overall impact because it changes the world. So you have this quote from you know some of these environmental leaders saying like giving you know a, a, a totally clean cheap source of energy is like giving an idiot child a machine gun so i think the core aversion to energy among the leaders is not that the process of producing it is dirty but that the use of energy impacts the world so that's my account of the hostility and then with nuclear which is such a tragedy which we may get into more it's that the the way we impact nature even though it has much less impact objectively in terms of anything negative it's, they think of it as unnatural. Like it's wrong for us to split the atom. It's wrong for us to create waste that'll add a long time. So I, I do think there is a certain consistency to it. 
uh, but I do think that consistency is an anti-human consistency. Well, one of the things that you just mentioned there, this sort of push towards solar and wind, there is, that's one of the direct contradictions. I think one of the most common ones that you get where they say that there's no real need of fossil fuels because moving forward, solar and wind and batteries are going to be able to provide everything that we need. And one of the biggest proponents of that has been the ESG movement. And they've caused a number of companies to commit to either 100% renewable or claim that they're all ready. What's your thoughts on that, Peter, the ESG movement and how they've sort of linked in with renewables? Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very strange. It's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the rhetorical uh, point I made the other day is that uh, whenever you hear ESG, you should just think CCP. Um, and uh, it's cer certainly the social and governance thing are just, are just uh, direct ways to try to get government, more government control over corporations in, in, one, in one way or another. Um, and then, you know, but e even, um, uh, and then, e of course, even the environmental way, way is just, uh, is just this, um, this, uh, this, this vehicle for, um, for uh, political control over corporations. And that's, I think that's the way you have to think of, uh, you have to, th you have to think of, a lot of it. it um, it's, it's, you know, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like a, um, it's like a formula for identifying enemies and organizing the public against them. It's, it, um, you know, a lot of it, you know, it's always very confusing because these things are, on one level, they're, they're very ideological and on another level, they're, they're sort of extremely fake and, and you have, you have sort of, you have some, you know, you have true believers and you have uh, people who are just in some kind of racket to, to, um, to rip other people off. And then you have, uh, you have a lot of useful idiots as well. And so you have sort of these, often you have these three different contingents we'd have to probably analyze. So, you know, um, I don't know, if there, for every Greta, there's a, you know, there's a um, Larry Fink at BlackRock who's, who's just trying to package up um, these, these, uh, these index funds so he can charge, you know, if you just had an index fund, you couldn't charge as much as if you have an ESG index fund. It sounds like you're doing a lot more work. So that's sort of the racket version is BlackRock. The, um, the autistic child leading the children's crusade, that's the, probably the true believer. And then, you know, probably most people are neither and are just, just the useful idiots. But uh, it's, you know, these, these things wouldn't work if they were only one of the three groups. So you have to probably uh, par parse, uh, and it's a synergy of the three that makes, gives them a lot of power. So I'm mean, curious, what's your, I mean, you know my sense from reading the book, but sort of what's your sense of the actual status of this enthusiasm for solar, wind, and batteries? Um, well, it's, um, it's always, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's hard, it's hard to score. I, th I think it is, um, it's, 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 cer it's certainly one of the things I've probably underestimated over the last decade or two, how much, how much, uh, how much traction this would, this would continue to have. Um, I suspect that there was a big watershed moment the last, uh, five, six months where we, we've, just hit a wall with with the Ukraine crisis, and it turns out um, that that actually um, all these things ha are not working as advertised. We haven't developed alternatives. We're not, you know, we're not even accessing fossil fuels in our in our own society enough, and so we can't easily replace um, replace the cutoff from Russia. And uh, and there's something about um, you know the the phenomenon of inflation in the last um, in the last year that's probably. Uh, um, that probably is going to going to lead to a lot of lot of pushback on it. Where you know the, you know if, if you sort of have if you have things that are less that you know, the, I often think of technology as doing more with less, and so anti-technology is doing, you know, less for more money. Or it's in, it's in, it's inflation, and then that's you know that that's what's what you know hadn't happened that much for the last few decades, and. Uh, Somehow, the, the, the concatenation of bad policies has crystallized in the last six months where um, the inflation is probably, uh, there probably is a very teachable moment. So I would say I've, I've been pessimistic about it for the last decade or two, but uh, I, I'm more optimistic now than at any point in the last two decades. You, you mean that people will see the truth? The, it's, I think you have a teachable moment, yeah. When the, when the, right. Look, look the, the, there's, you know, there's, a, there's sort of these charts of you know, baskets of commodity prices where energy is always the biggest, biggest component. And it was sort of a, basically a down channel for most of the 20th century, sort of went down. Uh, and then 
the, the, the first 20 years of the 21st century, it's gone sort of sideways. And uh, if the price spikes of the last few months actually sustain, it will be like um, the whole uh, sort of uh, genuinely progressive price channel of things um, being deflationary and costing less and technology and science and engineering advancing um, will, will be proven to have, to have reversed. And that would be, that'd be quite, that's quite a dramatic market signal we're getting, that markets are not working. I think that there's another of the direct contra contradictions that we see mostly, and it's that continuing to use fossil fuels is not just going to cause negative climate impact, but it's an outright climate apocalypse. Right? That's, that's the contention, where the world becomes completely unlivable. So given that that's such a highly promoted talking point, what gives you so much faith that this isn't going to come to fruition, especially when the anti-fossil fuel movement doesn't share your confidence? Yeah, the de de devil is not faith. I don't, I don't think of it that way. But yeah, it isn't, so it comes down to this issue of, of framework. So I, I, have the, the, I call the two frameworks the one in which you know, you believe that the earth is a delicate nurture and that it's immoral to impact it. I call that the anti-impact framework. And then the framework I use where you're focused on human flourishing and you recognize that the world is wild potential, I call that the human flourishing framework. And part of that is you look carefully at the benefits and side effects from a human flourishing perspective without this assumption that it's a delicate nurture that impacting is going to ruin. And, you know, what, what that means with climate is, so you take the phenomenon of rising CO2 levels, you have it on good authority that they have a warming impact, and so you should look into that. But what does it mean to look at that from a human flourishing perspective? It means, one, with the CO2 itself, you're open to not just negative impacts, but positive impacts and neutral impacts. So you're open to the idea that, for example, more CO2 means more plant food, and that could be good. But also more CO2 means more warming, and most places around the world want it to be warmer. And in particular, if you look at how the warming works, it tends to work in colder parts of the world where people definitely want it warmer. So it's more cold parts of the world becoming less cold. So already we see that the way the society... <laughs> the fan clubs are right. <laughs> the, the way the society, the way leading thinkers in the society are approaching it, there's basically no discussion of these positives and sort of obvious positives of CO2. So that's, that's a warning flag. Uh, but the biggest warning flag is this point about not looking at the benefits of the energy. And so, because the CO2 comes from a process of producing energy, which benefits people's lives. And in climate, it's particularly beneficial uh, because climate is naturally not a delicate nurture, just like the planet isn't as a whole. So nat climate is naturally dynamic, deficient, and dangerous, like deficient in terms of we don't always get the sunlight we want, we don't always get the rain we want. Of course, it's, it's very dangerous. So why you have mass climate-related deaths throughout history and what we can see is that the use of fossil fuels has made us dramatically safer from climate. So not just with heating and air conditioning, but maybe the most dramatic is in the realm of drought, because drought used to be the number one climate related killer. You know, having insufficient rainfall would kill a lot of people. And what fossil fuels enables to do is use these amazing machines to move water from where it is to where it's needed by irrigation and other methods. And you can also move food from where it is to where it's needed. And this, you know, the, the net effect of fossil fueled machines and then some other phenomena is that the rate of climate related disaster death, which is a key metric, has decreased 98% over the last century. So as I put it, fossil fuels haven't taken a safe climate and made it dangerous. They've taken a dangerous climate and made it safe. And what's so notable about this is this is, all, until like moral case for fossil fuels and a couple other things, this was never discussed. People treat it as if we are more endangered from climate than ever now. And one principle I have that I've found very helpful is that I never trust anyone to predict the future who distorts or denies the present. So when people portray today's world as a climate disaster, when it's actually a climate renaissance, that shows that they're either ignorant 
or they're looking at the world from this anti-human impact perspective. They're not looking at the world from how good is it, how good is it for, for human flourishing. They're look at, looking at it from the perspective of human impact is evil and we've impacted it a lot and therefore it's, it's bad. And so I, I think that this, the view of climate catastrophe is, if we just think about the basics in a pro-human way, it should be unbelievably unlikely that there's any kind of catastrophe, let alone apocalypse possible. And the fact that the leading thinkers to a man or a woman deny the client, what I call the climate mastery benefits of fossil fuels and do not look objectively at the positives of CO2 in addition to the negatives, that shows that there's a philosophical bias. And so what I try to do in, in part three of Fossil Future is I try to look at what are the climate mastery benefits? What are the side effects, positive and negative? And it's, it's like, it was shocking even to me how not, how impossible apocalypse is. And I'll put that literally impossible because if you look at the history of the planet, we've had way higher temperatures, way more CO2. We have no way of getting to the level that we used to be. The world was more tropical. The mo life flourished. The most you could argue is that we're getting there faster than we would like, but that's not an apocalypse. That's a disruptive rate of transition. And so I, I, it's really all just anti-human philosophy distorting these things. You do have legitimate climate scientists trying to model having a certain understanding of some physics, but what's happening is their, whatever legitimate insight they have is being totally distorted by this anti-human, what I call anti-impact framework. So in, in reality, we're, we're in a climate renaissance and if we continue to be free and free to use energy, it'll just get better. Um, well, you know, I, th I, th I think there sort of are so many ways this kind of precautionary principle gets abused. Uh, my, my initial move would be just, we should just get all these people in a room and have them sorted out first. And so we have the Greta crowd with the, uh, you know, the, the runaway positive feedback loop climate, catas climate catastrophe. But then we also have the AI people where the supercomputer is going to kill everybody. And then we have, um, you know, we have the um, people who are scared of nanotechnology. You'll have a runaway gray goo. There are, there's a problem of, um, you know, um, of uh, bi bio, uh, biotech research leading to vi viruses. There's, um, you know, I, w I might counter that I'm, I'm, um, I'm more worried about uh, the, the mind virus that's called progressivism and is leading to an apocalyptic mental health breakdown throughout our whole society. But, uh, but anyway, if we sort of just enumerate all these different ones, um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's not exactly clear why we'd, um, why we'd uh, prior prioritize the, uh, the climate change one. Um, at, at the very top, and then the the meta the meta version I always like to say is that I think we need to have um, some precaution about the precautionary principle itself, where um, where uh, you know we have eight billion people on this planet and we can't just snap our fingers and go back to the Neolithic hunter gatherer age where people maybe were on a paleo diet but you had like maybe ten million people, and uh, you you can't you can't just uh, go back to that and um, you know if if you try to if you try to freeze things. Uh, if you try to stop things in our world, uh, that itself will be apocalyptic and catastrophic because, um, you know, in a in a uh, in a zero-sum world um, where you try to turn the clock back on science and technology, um, it, it will be catastrophic for, for for the people who live. And so, even if even if there are extremely large dangers with with fossil fuels, I, I would say, um, and even if there's some legis some you know legitimate you know, theories you can construct on where there could be runaway effects. Um, the cost benefit tells us we, we have to go forward and we have to somehow, you know, um, get through to the other side with, uh, with, with, with the science and technology. So I, I agree with you, although I, even though I think, you know, the, the precautionary principle is maybe a little bit scarier than, 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 uh, than, than people say. But uh, yeah, philosophically, we have to somehow reframe this whole discussion of nature where, you know, nature is not, um, a nice mother, but is more like a stingy stepmother, and um, and is 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 a problem to be overcome rather than you know some a a a, uh, um, a rationalization for everything that's awful in our world. Well, that's that sort of performative empathy is pretty present in a lot of different topics, right? It's the same with the climate discussion. It seems like. What, what, what do you mean? So performative empathy that it seems to me like it is the cool empathetic outward based view that makes people look good it sounds good to be green it sounds like the, the the empathetic view but obviously as you say alex that's disregarding the fact it's a very bourgeois way to look at things a very western way to look at things you, you have to be 
in a place where you can afford energy, where you have access to clean energy. So what, one, three billion people on the planet don't have access to consistent energy and a big chunk of them are on wood and dung? Yeah, definitely. I, I agree totally with what Peter said about, I, I don't have the exact words, but about just reframing or reconceiving the view of nature. And that's, that's a lot of what I try to do in my work and particularly in fossil futures, just blast well, Peter, now I like stingy stepmother. That has a nice ring to it. But what I call delicate nurture view of nature. And, and that's, it's such an easy view to refute. And what I found is if you just make it explicit, like I've done or like Peter has done, it's pretty easy to break that in people because it's such a pseudoscientific view. So there's a lot of leverage in just making that explicit and really emphasizing that, again, nature is dynamic, deficient, dangerous, and we need to impact it massively. And part of this is, if you want to talk about catastrophe or apocalypse, I consider poverty an apocalypse. Because if any of us here were put in the state that five plus billion people, you know, who live on less than ten dollars a day, we would consider that a total catastrophe in our lives. And yet again, five billion people living on less than ten dollars a day, you know, three billion people using less electricity than a refrigerator, three billion more approximately using about four refrigerators worth, you know, compared to we use mul many multiples of that. Um, so I think it's very important to just reframe and reconceive our view of nature and then really be humanistic in terms of pointing to, hey, there are a lot of people who still live a natural life and they want to live an unnaturally good life. And that requires low cost, reliable, scalable energy. And if, if you're not recognizing that, then there's a problem. And then if you're opposing fossil fuels, that's a huge problem. If you're opposing fossil fuels, nuclear hydro, and you're opposing the mining transmission lines and construction for solar and wind and batteries, then it's really, you just hate human impact. And that means ultimately you hate human life. Just like if somebody said, hey, you know what? I hate bear impact. I want to eliminate bear impact. You'd be like, that person hates bears and wants to kill bears. And I want people to view the modern environmental movement that way. When we want to eliminate human impact, that ultimately means eliminating human beings. Speaking about energy prices, energy prices have become uh, spicy, to say the least, recently. And we've had energy and fertilizer shortages, and agriculture's been hit, and the president's talking about famine, and there is a, a war going on as well. How much of that has been mediated by energy supply? Is, is this a, a proper global energy crisis? And what, what do you think are the, the root causes here? So I'm very curious to hear Peter's view. I have a very, my view of this is it's very, the fundamentals are simple and everyone who caused it is trying to make it complex to absolve themselves of responsibility. So my simple version of this is that we, not just we in the US, but many, free countries and wealthy countries around the world. We, re we dramatically restricted investment in fossil fuels, production of fossil fuels, and transport of fossil fuels on the false promise that they could be replaced by unreliable solar and wind. That was a false promise. I don't think there was any reason to believe it in the first place, but it certainly turned out to be false. And so two basic things happen. One is that there's less supply in the world than there would otherwise be because we've so restricted the ability to supply energy, including post-pandemic. And the other thing is that we become dramatically more reliant on the energy there is uh, from foreign nations, particularly hostile nations. And that's what Europe is seeing with Russia. You know, they decided we're going to restrict domestic fossil fuel production. Uh, in many cases, including Germany, also restricting nuclear. And so what happens is they still need fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, because solar and wind re re rely very directly on natural gas to cycle up and down because they have this intermittency that you need something as flexible as natural gas to handle. And so, yeah, they did the same. They did this basic thing. They artificially restricted supply, domestic supply. It didn't get replaced. And so overall supply is down. And in particular, they're hugely dependent and it's a crisis. So I think of it as very simple. And I think everyone is trying to say it's not that because they caused it. But I'm curious what Peter thinks about this. Yeah, no, um, it's I, I think it is it is very profoundly created by the by the politics. Of course, you then have to say, you know, why Again, you go back to the question we started: Why, why were people so sympathetic to these, uh, these backwards politics? But one, you know, the U.S. Has, has been relatively more open than other countries. Where you know we did have the fracking revolution over the last decade. But it sort of, it struck me the other day, and I'm not totally sure this theory is correct. But it struck me that uh, the contours of it are very different from what people would have predicted in uh, 2012. You know, 2012 it was sort of these Midwestern states. It was you know North Dakota with the Bakken field that was going to be really big. Pennsylvania was going to have massive fracking. And, um, 
And fast forward from 2012 to 2022, um, and the industry is overwhelmingly in Texas. And um, I sort of wonder whether um, um, the, the sort of the feature that Texas has that enabled it to work is that it's quite big. Um, it has direct access to the ocean. And so you were able to basically um, um, let the industry exist without federal interference. Whereas um, all the other states, you had to um, control uh, the pipelines and the transportation modes a a across uh, different states. And so uh, North Dakota, you know, the Keystone pipeline could get blocked. And that turned out to be an incredibly important way to, uh, to block the, uh, the, the North Dakota one. Or Pennsylvania should have uh, fracked and produced energy for New York State, but New York State refused to build the pipelines. And so you couldn't do anything with the energy produced in Pennsylvania. It would be much harder to do this. So, uh, so yeah, there, I, 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 I think yeah, there's sort of a many granular levels where, where sort of what, what happened um, is just a function of the deranged uh, politics. It, it's, it seems very odd that you know, um, the geologic formations you know, on this planet are such that the only place in the world where fracking can be done is Texas. You know, it's not, it's, it's like, it used to be it was just the US for some mysterious reason, but at this point it looks like it's just, you know, it's a first approximation, it's only Texas. And, uh, and that seems to me is probably not a truth of geology or of science, but uh, is telling us something very interesting about the politics. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the Texas geology did turn out to be really good, but you know, I mean, we're in Southern California right now, and I mean, not for fracking, although there's some questions about it, but, you know, we have amazing geology here, and we've had an amazing history of oil, and I think California is a microcosm, because we used to be this prolific oil state, we still have a lot of potential, and yet these anti-impact ideas have just gutted our oil industry to the point where, you know, I, you feel sorry for people, and you, you, I admire people in the California oil industry, but it's so tough. And you see this with these other states as well, like people in Colorado, North Dakota is a little bit better, but in, what you see is more and more people, to Peter's point, like migrate to Texas. And, and when you hear somebody's in Texas, you kind of are optimistic about them. When you hear they're somewhere else, you think, oh God, you're not gonna last very long. I, I don't know if I would invest in that. And I, it's, it's, you really have sympathy for them. So, and that's, but then also the US, like look at the US in fracking compared to Europe. I mean, Europe just, preemptively banned fracking all over the place when it was proven to be the most promising energy technology recently developed. Like we handed them a gift of this knowledge of how to turn useless shale rock into bountiful oil and gas. And their reaction was let's ban it and then get more oil and gas from Russia. So it just shows you how these bad philosophies can just handicap people totally against their interests. So yeah, of course, I'm of course inclined often just to have, you know, crazier conspiracy the okay. theories of politics or something like this where um, you know the um, you know was um, was the anti-nuclear thing was that just was that just an environmental philosophy or was that uh, you know was that something that was pushed by you know was was that literally just pushed by Russia because that's that would create the energy dependency on on Russia and uh, and it probably is both yeah. it's again you know there's sort of like an ideological layer and then there is you know this sort of um, you know narrowly self-interested actors who figure out ways to, uh, to take advantage of this to well, do this. What was your name for the, so you had the three categories, is the true believers, what was the Larry Fink category? Um, I don't know if I have a good label, but it's sort of like the, 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 um, the racketeers, let's call them okay. the racketeers. And then uh, the third one was the useful idiots, which okay. I think is the largest, but okay. uh, maybe it's the, it's the interaction of the three that's very important. Yeah, so I, useful idiots I may think is a much smaller category, but I, I, the, the true believers and the racketeers I think are very important. And I mean, we have good documentation, for example, with the history of nuclear, where you do have very shamefully certain uh, pro-fossil fuel interests opposing nuclear. But I, the way I think of it is you have the true believers who spread the basic philosophy that human impact is intrinsically evil and inevitably self-destructive. And then that maps well to nuclear, but then certain opportunistic racketeers say, hey, I can make money off this. And you look at like what happened with the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club used to be pro-nuclear, and then they went anti-nuclear, and that coincided pretty well with a big check from some oil companies. Uh, Michael Schellenberger, uh, by the way, vote for Michael Schellenberger for governor. That's my first ever public endorsement of a politician um, in, in California. So yeah, he has a really good documentation of this in Apocalypse Never. So I, I do think both of the, like the conspiracy things are real, but I think they're at root philosophical. And so I, my focus is trying to change the philosophy and then you make it less profitable for Larry Fink to racketeer off this and he'll racketeer off something else. 
Speaking about domestic energy, moving forward, how do you think America's energy policy is going to affect its national security? Well, it's um, well. I, I would say the uh, the, the pro probably the the the, 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 ba the basic frame framework would just be um, if if we are um, you know if we are energy independent, we have to be less um, militarily entangled with the rest of the world, and that's 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 sort of that's sort of um, that's sort of roughly the, the way these things these things map and. Uh, and I, th I, th I think the uh, you know the, the shift um, the shift in the last decade towards energy independence probably you know at, at some point will, will will link up with a um, you know with a less interventionist U.S. Um, U.S. foreign policy and uh, and you know as a as sort of a you know you know moderately anti-war libertarian I, I think that that would be a good thing but that's yeah. But that's. But I, th I think of them as very, very entangled. I want to. Apologies to our host if I butcher this, but I want to get a point I learned from Palmer Lucky recently. I think I, I learned it properly, which he made, and I thought this is such a good point that I never thought of, which is if so. The the point there's this point about you know you become less dependent if you can if you have more energy security, but if you think about wars. Historically, this is the first is a Daniel Jurgen point. Just the you know the big world wars were won by the side with the most access to cost-effective energy, namely oil. Like they you know that's the fuel of mobility, um, and that's a crucial point. But there's also this point Palmer made is that you, know, you look at wars and you need huge domestic production ability to win wars. And when I just thought of it from that perspective and sustained, like sustained over time to produce weapons, but also to produce everything else. And you think about what happens when you gut your energy industry and every other industry versus what China has done, and that scares the hell out of me. So I think we need real change in the energy industry, but also in all of these other high impact industries, uh, because it's just terrifying to think about like China's ability to sustain domestic production uh, compared to ours. Yeah, I, th I think there's probably a whole history of maybe maybe going back even the last two centuries where. Uh, where um, where the energy dimension was a very important dimension of uh, you know many of these conflicts. I think you know uh, um, World War One. There was some shift from coal to oil that was sort of going on in the background, um, where which was going to somehow change the geopolitics of Britain, which was a massive coal power. Uh, Churchill, I, I think, um, seized had the British government seize all the oil fields in the Middle East and Iraq a, a few months before the war started. So there was sort of a sense that this was going to be you know a central part of the conflict. You know, if you go back even further, um, I, I, I haven't studied this in a lot of detail, but I, I wonder whether the Civil War in the United States, you have to think of as in, in part, it was powered by coal, that was the main source of energy, and uh, an incredibly important piece was getting West Virginia to secede from Virginia, because that was the coal state, and then that shifted all the coal production to the north, and uh, gave it an enormous advantage in the war. Oh, just one more thing, Peter, earlier you said the thing about teachable moment. I just want to amplify that. I think we're in such a teachable moment right now. So I'm born in 1980, and so I've never lived through an energy crisis or an inflation crisis. I mean, I was very little when there was still an inflation crisis. Now, I know the history, but it's, it's not concrete to most people that it's really possible to have an energy crisis or an inflation crisis until recently. And I definitely didn't wish for either of these but it is really giving us the raw material for a lesson. Now, there's no guarantee because I'd say the wrong side will always misinterpret everything, especially when there are their failures involved, but it's easier for people to be concerned about the issue and it's easier to tell the truth. So I think we are at this amazing moment and so I'm, I'm happy that my book got delayed a bunch, so it's getting released just at this moment when people are open to the idea that maybe it should be a fossil future and maybe it will whether you want it to be or not. You know, a year ago, when I told people my title, they thought, oh, that's crazy. We're in energy transition. You don't hear that too much right now. You hear Joe Biden, of all people, who ran on, I guarantee you we will end fossil fuel, scrambling for fossil fuels and trying to pretend to us that he has done nothing to oppose fossil fuels whatsoever. So I think that shows that we're in a moment where people are more open than ever to fossil fuels and more suspicious of the people who've told us that fossil fuels are all bad and we don't really need them because solar and wind and batteries are already basically replacing them. So that's energy policy. Looking even more broadly, Peter, what do you think are the biggest threats to national security over the coming decades? I don't know. There probably are, there probably are a lot of, lot of different, different things. Um, 
one, one can say, but I, you know, the, the, the one that maybe connects to this, um, this uh, climate change debate, I, I, I often say that I, I believe our biggest political problem is the problem of political correctness. It's the problem of, 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 of you know, um, of groupthink, of, um, of sort of all these, um, you know, incredible pressures to create, uh, to create consensus. Um, and then this is, ob this is also certainly one of the, you know, one of the undercurrents of, of this, this particular debate that uh, there's been no dissent allowed. You know, I, I've often said I'd be much more, I'd be much more open to believing in the problematic nature of climate change if I believed there was a vigorous debate in which, you know, um, people could actually have this debate in which people, you know, could get tenure in universities who had uh, different, different views on this. And, um, and you know, even if, even if we have, you know, even if we have a runaway climate change problem and it's apocalyptic, I, don't, I think the, the debate is so distorted by ideology, we won't possibly get to the right answers. I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe methane is a more dangerous, um, you know, um, um, uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and we should be worried about eating steaks rather than driving cars. But uh, the, um, the universities and the, the whole sort of knowledge production system is, is, is so deranged that it couldn't even resolve that micro debate um, where you know, we, we can agree it's apocalyptic, but we have to figure out whether it's methane or carbon dioxide. Can't even have that debate, and uh, and that that's sort of the uh, you know, that's sort of the uh, the, uh, the the general um, the the, the uh, it's the, sort of this group thing consensus political correctness problem broadly understood that I think is our our greatest challenge. You know, I want to say one 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 other um, very positive thing about you know you know. Alex's book, and you know, there, there are sort of a number of people I who I would describe as sort of moderate climate change skeptics, and and there's something about uh, the um, Alex approaches that's a little bit sharper in the sense of both senses of the word sharp, as you know, uh, both as not not nice, and um, and um, like more high IQ, and uh, like just you know you're not giving the other side you're just you know just punching punching on the argument, and uh, that's that's what we need to have to have a real debate and real discussion. You know, it's it's you have you have to be at like plus a hundred the way you described in your book. You have to just, um, you know, sharply articulate um, very divergent views so we can have any chance of getting you know getting to to the right answers. Um, uh, I you know I was I was giving this talk to um, the Atlas Society a few months ago, and you always sort of realize these things you can talk out, say afterwards are good. It was sort of half the people were, were libertarian, and half the people were Ayn, Ayn Rand followers. And I, I was, I was thinking of the provocative thing to say was there was this, you know, one, you know, all these different things you quote from Ayn Rand. But one was, you know, I'm not a libertarian. It was sort of all these ways you denounced libertarians, and then you can say, well, that's kind of silly because there's not that much of a difference. Or where, where are these differences? But uh, I think the difference. Uh, and the reason yours is sort of a Randian book and not a conservative book or a libertarian book, but a but a Randian book is she, um, Ayn Rand didn't trust um, um, that uh, that all these things would would get too easily um, um, veer in the direction of social consensus, status, easy approval from other people. She didn't like you know the happy clappy church that was conservatism. She didn't trust the hippy dippy commune. That was libertarianism, and uh, and uh, uh, your book, Alex, is uh, she would have approved of your book because it's not uh, it's um, it's not some hippy dippy left libertarian synthesis, and it's not um, you know just sort of a happy clappy conservative thing. It's you're just thinking for yourself. Uh, can I? I'm going to tell a quick Peter Thiel story, which is um, so how I met Peter Thiel. I don't know if he remembers this, but. Uh, in 2006, I was working at the Ayn Rand Institute, and I, was, I, I had no interest in energy, no knowledge about energy at all. So I got interested in 2007. And um, a guy in San Francisco said, hey, I, I like your writings on business, want to get together with a bunch of people in San Francisco who like Ayn Rand. And I said, sure. And so there's a guest list, and there were like six people I didn't know, <laughs> who I had no idea there were, including someone named Peter Thiel. And I had no idea. And I was driving with my friend to the event. I was like, wait, this guy founded PayPal. And like, this is pretty cool that he, he did this. Um, but I remember I asked him at the end, you know, what makes you, and I didn't know that he was the first uh, outside investor in Facebook at the time, but I knew he had been successful. I was like, what makes you so good at investing? 
and he said something to the effect of, and we had been talking about Ayn Rand, like, like has, a, has an ability to recognize these individuals of great ability, like the kind that Ayn Rand talks about. And uh, I think he's certainly proven to be able to do that, but I just, I've always thought of that ever since. Every time I see a big Peter Thiel success, I'm like, oh yeah, you really are good at doing that. <laughs> so, uh, moving more forward, questions, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> moving forward away from the uh, more apocalyptic uh, viewpoint, what do you think are the best prospects for positive change in the coming decades, and what can people do to make a positive difference as well? So let me just say one thing about the apocalyptic thing, which why I'm not at all afraid of that kind of thing is, so apocalyptic is a value judgment. So, and what, what needs to go into an apocalypse or a catastrophe is not just a change in nature, but like an adverse change in nature that its own would be adverse, but our total inability to master that change. And everything I see in the realm of climate is, you know, what can happen? It can get warmer, but it can't get that much warmer given the history of the planet. There are limits to how much warmer it can get by the physics of CO2, by what we know about the history of the planet. Uh, and, you know, the really other thing is sea levels can rise and that's related to warmth and that's, you know, the oceans can change chemistry somewhat, but they've had prolific life with all sorts of different chemistries. So I really do think it comes down to are we experiencing a disruptive rate of change from a less tropical earth to a more tropical earth? So that's just how I think of it and why I don't think of it apocalyptically. Um, I'm pretty optimistic about the, the future of this intellectually, both because we have this teachable moment, uh, but also because I think the, the, the group that I'm, uh, like I, I do think of my arguments as, like I have my own arguments and I appreciate what Peter says about the sharpness of them. So I don't, I don't wanna ascribe my arguments to anyone or theirs to me, but I do think there's this broader group of what I would call energy humanists. And I think the thing that we have in common is this issue of looking at both the benefits and side effects of energy from a human perspective. And so in this category, I'd put Michael Schellenberger, Bjorn Lomborg, uh, Matt Ridley, Robert Bryce, and um, Steve Koonin. And if you look at the past few years, we've had three major bestsellers by energy humanists. So we've had Michael Schellenberger's book, Apocalypse Never, Bjorn Lomborg's book, False Alarm, and Steve Koonin's book, Unsettled. And one thing that's been really notable about that is the other side has had no coherent response to it at all. Like Scientific American had a kind of obvious hit piece against it where they literally took quotes from a Washington Post op-ed summarizing Koonin and attacked those. This is in Scientific American. They didn't engage his arguments. They attacked a Washington Post op-ed summary and then they didn't give him a chance to respond. Uh, so we're getting these superficial attacks and then anyone who follows my work might know like recently what I've been getting is some organizations, including the Washington Post, trying to do hit pieces on me with these bizarre claims that what the individuals things I wrote in college were somehow racist, which is both bizarre that they're looking there to argue with my views now and that they can interpret individualism as racism. But it's just a total failure to engage with the core arguments and in particular the human flourishing framework of, hey, do we want to advance human flourishing? Do we recognize that the earth is not delicate nurture, a delicate nurture is wild potential. And do we look carefully at the full context, benefits and side effects? And there's really no answer for that. And it's really a remarkable situation where this monopoly is so weak and more and more people are exposing them as weak. So you're seeing like Kuhn and Schellenberger have been on the Joe Rogan uh, experience. So we're getting more and more exposure and there's nothing really stopping it. And the current events are proving us right. So that's why I'm very optimistic that there can be a big change. And I'm, one reason I'm grateful to all of you for being interested in this book, it's coming out in a little over a month on May 24th, but by you being aware of it and talking about it, you're gonna introduce a lot more open-minded people. And, and these ideas have a really good penetration when they're introduced to people who are open-minded. My, my work in particular is all written for people who expect to disagree. So if you read Fossil Future and like it, try to find somebody who expects to disagree and, and share it with them and see, see what they think. So I, I am optimistic in this way. That said, the policy, including the ESG, is like terrifyingly bad and has a lot of resource behind it. So there's, there's this optimistic growth of the good view, but the existing Leviathan is pretty big and pretty scary. You know, I, th I think there are times to be optimistic, there are times to be pessimistic. I, I often 
wonder if the healthiest approach is somewhere in between. And I, I, I always think you know, that there's a way in which extreme optimism and extreme pessimism are sort of um, cash out the same way because they both tell you that individual action doesn't matter. If, if you're extremely optimistic, you know, um, all the problems will take care of themselves, nothing you need to do. Uh, if you're extremely pessimistic, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, it, nothing you can do. But they sort of both double up as um, sort of ideologies for rationalizing laziness and inaction. And I often, uh, so I, I, even though I think there are times to be very optimistic or very pessimistic, I often think the healthy thing is to say we can't be sure and maybe it's, it's somewhere in between because uh, we should always um, you know, believe in the indomitability of the human spirit and ability for um, you know, individual human action. Um, you know, I think, I think one other uh, place, though, where, um, where I, I hope we can um, have a teachable moment or a, you know, um, rethink some things uh, from, from first principles is, you know, this, this question of, of science and, and what is science. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely not like on that, on that, that sort of silly um, billboard people have on their doors where, you know, in this household we, you know, we, we believe in science. Uh, science with a capital S is not science. Um, and uh, you know, I've, I've often said that uh, uh, there's often this almost almost a tell where when people use the word science, um, you know, you don't call things chemical science or physical science because um, you know it's physics and chemistry, and we use science for things like you know political science or climate science when we have to you know we have to exaggerate the amount of science because there isn't that much going on. It's like a tell, like in poker, that you're bluffing or, or so something like that. Um, you know, I, I studied philosophy of science as an undergraduate. And I think one of the one of the ways I've come to think of what science at its best is supposed to do is is, is fight a two front war against excessive dogmatism and excessive skepticism. If you have too much dogmatism, if it's just like you know, in the 17th century origins, the you know the the sort of um, moribund Aristotelianism of the Catholic Church, and you're sort of you want to question excessive dogmatism. That's, that's sort of one of the things science has to do. But you also have to, you're also supposed to question excess skepticism. So if I don't believe you're on stage and we're not real and nothing exists, um, that's probably not the sort of world in which you're going to be able to do science. And so somehow, and it's somehow not always that easy to, to get, get that balance right. Um, and if I, and again, this is sort of a qualitative judgment. I'll just sort of make, leave it in a somewhat conclusory way. But you know, in, in 2022, science is very deranged because it is all anti-skepticism um, and it is not anti-dogmatism -dog at all. Um, you know, if, you, if you ask scientists, not just on climate change, but on any topic, what are the heterodox scientific beliefs you're allowed to have where you are different from the scientific consensus? You're not allowed to have any in anything. Science is just anti-skepticism. It's, it's about debunking skeptics. Um, it, is, it, is, um, it is not about independent thought, debunking excessive dogmatism, even though probably you know, the, the anti-dogmatic part was the more important part of the, of, of the two-front war historically. It still gets portrayed as anti-dogmatic in children's books. Um, it's, you know, a scientist is an independent thinker who comes up with uh, new, new ideas about the universe. But uh, in, in its actual reality, it's 100% you know, anti-skepticism. And as a result, it is just uh, you know, it is just, um, it is, it is, it, it's, it's far crazier than anything the medieval Catholic Church ever produced. I mean, at least, at least the, at least the medieval Church was sort of consistent and sort of stayed the same over a few centuries. And we've had, you know, we've had these hairpin loop turns where it's, it's like straight out of George Orwell's 1984. And you know, you know, a year ago the, the vaccines aren't necessary. You don't need to take them now. You have to take them. We've had sort of one hairpin loop turn after another on. On, on, on so many uh, so many different topics, and, and there's something like that um, in, in in the sort of deranged uh, dogmatism of, of of science that uh, that that hopefully we we have also a moment to push back on that. Can I, I want to just elaborate on one aspect I see of why it's maybe even more deranged than that in a certain aspect. So one one concept I've found helpful in writing this book is what I call the concept of the knowledge system. And part of what the knowledge system, this concept helps us understand, is how it's possible, even when scientific researchers are basically right about something, for people to take terrible, terrible actions 
uh, on the basis of it. So, you know, one example I think is, um, well, like historically, you know, eugenics, for example, these, these, you know, forced sterilization, but even, even like the Nazi version had this imprimatur of science there. But what happens? Is it really that the research scientists knew, like they were all confident that it was good to, you know, euthanize people, to sterilize them, et cetera? A, no, that's not what they all believed. And B, they weren't even a position, in a position to know that, possibly because that involves a value judgment, right? Evaluating what to do as an action involves a value judgment. And I found it very helpful to think of the, there's, this, there's this relationship between the most basic knowledge and action, where there's the researchers who do the basic research. Then there are the synthesizers who try to take all that research and put it together so that it's useful. And there are the disseminators, like, say, the New York Times or the Washington Post, who give the synthesized knowledge to the general public and then there are the evaluators, like policymakers or pundits, who try to take that and tell us what to do. And particularly the last stage I want to want to focus on is really deranged. So you take something like COVID, where whatever was right about the science of it, in the realm of evaluation, it was taken as dogma that we should optimize for eliminating this virus at all costs, which is completely indefensible as in a method of evaluation, but because it was coupled with people with expertise, real or alleged in the field, it was treated as, oh yeah, of course we're supposed to do this. And I think one, one sign that science has this religious character today is that it dictates evaluations as scientific. And that should never happen in any era. The scientists should be saying, hey, here's what's true about the reality, about cause and effect in my domain. Then you need to integrate other domains and use your own methods of evaluation, including your values, to make a decision. But as soon as somebody says science says do X, you know you're dealing with a fraud and you know you're dealing with somebody who wants to impose a kind of religious dogma. Yeah, um, I don't know. There's so many, so many different things to say. I, I'm not a big fan of Immanuel Kant, but I always think that his his uh, thing ought implies can. It's 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 better to take the contrapositive of that, which is um, cannot implies that there's no ought, and uh, and uh, and so for example, if we um, cannot have a world of human flourishing in which we radically cut fossil fuel use, then there's no imperative, there's no moral imperative to do that, and uh, and I th I think if we had a you know, a healthier understanding of um, of of costs and benefits, and of, of 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 some facts like that. The the kinds of values that it would push us to would be probably um, um, less extreme value judgments. And we're making you know we're, that that's probably the way I would that that's the way I would couple it. Yeah, we're we're just you know we're we're in a world where um, there's uh, way too much morality, and uh, it's it's normally a way to um, get people to do very bad things. Okay, we are ready for some questions, ladies and gentlemen. Peter, I like what you said about college. If you're going to college today, what degree would you take or suggest taking? Well, I, I, I've been on the anti-college crusade for about 12 years, and I mean, they, they I, yeah, I would, I would, I would strongly rethink that. I mean, the, um, I, I, I've, I've said that you know the two, the two degrees that actually I think where you got well-paying jobs out of undergraduate were computer science, and um, and it's odd that you know this has been working for decades, but still um, it has somehow not actually filtered through. Um, and um, but then the other one where you get uh, probably the other. Um, degree where you get a very well-paying job is petroleum engineering. And so those, those are the two things you should major in. <laughs> and then the petroleum engineering one, it's, it's somehow all the, uh, um, all the uh, uh, political insanity um, creates this market where nobody goes into it, and therefore the few people who do get better paying jobs. If you want to be an entrepreneur, do you think college is really necessary? Well, I, 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 I mean, necessary is such a it's way less than necessary. I mean, it's 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 uh, it's 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 probably for a lot of things. It's probably just profoundly counterproductive. You know, um, you know, there's probably a, you know. I think um, I think for success in a lot of dimensions, it's important to think things through from first principles, to think for yourself, and uh, and to the extent that college takes 
you know, very talented people and makes them less capable of that, it's, it's extraordinarily toxic. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, there's sort of, I don't, know, I don't want to go on this long riff, but uh, I've, I've, of, I've often thought that one could evaluate uh, the colleges um, by, uh, you know, if you look at how ambitious people are, their senior year in high school, and how much ambition has been beaten out of them after, you know, four, four years of college, maybe two, two, three years after they graduate. Um, and you should rank the colleges by how much they dis how dis destructive they are. And then, you know, I, I went to Stanford. It was relatively less destructive because it was sort of um, in the sun and people pretended not to work, and uh, they weren't like too damaged. Um, you know, Yale uh, people are sort of encouraged to do eccentric things. You have this problem with what you do with all these smart people. They don't know what to do with it. At Princeton, everyone's just told to be drunk the whole time. Um, Harvard, they're told to compete even more. I think Harvard's the most damaging. I think the two that are even worse are MIT and Caltech, where uh, you're the, the smartest physics, math student in high school, and after four years of Caltech, you, um, you're so beaten up that you're hoping to become a line manager at Lockheed Martin in 20 years' time or something like that. So, uh, so they're just absolutely destructive. Motivation degradation index. We can have a little yes. thing for that. Uh, okay, up next. On the ESG front, what do you think is the teachable moment for us to fight it? Well, I think one instance of what I would call the teachable moment is, is Peter had this talk the other day at the Bitcoin conference where he was very uh, aggressively negative toward ESG. And while he probably has been throughout the duration of this cult that has arisen really in the last three or four years, uh, there's a broader trend of high profile people now attacking ESG that wasn't happening even two years ago. I mean, I, I've gone through the whole arc of this because until fairly recently, a lot of my work has been consulting on messaging with companies. Now I do more direct to public stuff myself, but for years I did. And there was just this period of three years where nobody knew the letters ESG. And then everybody said, oh, this is all we care about. You know, ESG, we love ESG. Sometimes it gets grouped with sustainability, which is another terrible word because it implies freedom and capitalism are unsustainable, which is another discussion. But what's, what we're seeing now is people are trying to go away from it. And even somebody like Larry Fink, you know, whom we've talked about deservedly negatively tonight, even he is going away from his whole net zero push. And he's now embracing fossil fuels in different kinds of ways. Now, you could say this is cynical, but part of what people are realizing is that these ESG pressures on energy companies has made them produce less the pressure has made them produce less domestic energy, and that's a bad thing that's harming us right now. So people are sort of scurrying away from that, and even you have like JP Morgan saying we need more natural gas, et cetera. So there's that element, but I think, I think the key to having a real teachable moment with anything is having a positive alternative. So while ESG is not my field, I've done a little work on defining the positive alternative. And if you go to the website energytalkingpoints.com, and you search long-term value creation, you can see what I've come up with, but that's the basic concept, L, you know, LVC. So essentially it's saying that, yeah, companies have an obligation to pursue profit, but it's part of an idea of long-term value creation. And, and I don't wanna to get too much into it, but what it needs to do, just like the anti-industry side succeeded by embracing environment, ESG succeeds by embracing long-term thinking and caring about the wider world. And it has no right to that because it's really short-term opportunism and destructive to the wider world. But I think we need a long-term value creation movement that embraces long-term thinking, that thinks about all the different impacts on the business, but that doesn't have any of this anti-human impact, anti-fossil fuel, anti-nuclear thing. And I think that can win. So we, we are at a moment where people are questioning it, but we need a positive alternative, not just being anti-ESG. Up next. Beyond books and beyond white papers and print things, what are some very specific strategies we can employ to reframe the narrative? Well, this is always a, a very, very partial answer, but I, th I think the, the, um, the first part is to just uh, talk about it and describe it. And so if you take ESG at face value, that's, uh, you know, that's very different from describing it as, you know, maybe it's, Maybe it's a crazed ideology. There, there are times when it's, you know, it's an effective racket. There, are, you know, the, a successful proto ESG thing that worked on a corporate level was uh, Walmart in the 2000s, where they were under a lot of pressure from labor unions because they weren't paying their workers enough, and they had, you know, and rather than paying their workers more, they decided it would be cheaper to rebrand themselves as a green corporation and break up 
um, the left-wing anti-Walmart alliance. If you broke off the environmentalists, it would weaken the anti-Walmart thing, and you'd get the company out of the doghouse. And so you can just describe what actually happened. And, um, and you know, maybe it's understandable why Walmart did what they did, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, this paragon of, of, of moral virtue. And, uh, and so I think just understanding it is, you know, is the first part to deconstructing it. There, you know, there are things that only work when people don't understand how they work. They work less well when you understand them. You know, when you see what's going on in the sausage making factory, if, you have, if you're forced to watch a YouTube video of how foie gras gets made every time you eat it, you might become a vegan. And that's, that's, that's the first step of what we should be doing. Uh, can I just make one quick comment about that? So, uh, you know, the questioner Brian Gitt is an example of what I think is very effective which is having really articulate and compelling individuals make these points. So different people, what I call energy humanists, I'd include Brian as one of those. Like I'm pretty deliberate about every time I see somebody new on the scene who's good and has good arguments, I really promote them in whatever way I can. Like I, you know, I bring them on my podcast, I promote them on Twitter. And, you know, to everyone who's been good, like Schellenberger, uh, Lomborg, et cetera, like I do everything I can to promote that, in part because I know that individuals are so effective at embodying ideas and communicating ideas, in part because people will, you know, if you get into an individual's ideas, you'll spend hours and hours and hours listening to them and you can really take it in. You'll read their books, you'll listen to their interviews. It's very hard to do that with a new association. And often when I've worked with industry, they'll try to start a new association. And what I've told them in the past is you should just take like the five or 10 people who are most effective and pay for more PR for them. And that's in effect what I've done just recreationally with my own limited resources is try to promote these individuals who are very effective and give them a broader audience. And so the kind of very, you could argue, self-serving implication of this is it's going to be a really good thing when this book is a blockbuster. And I think it's, a, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, but it can be made a bigger blockbuster because what happens is we've seen there's no opposition to these really good energy humanist arguments, but you need people who can embody them and talk about them. And as I said, we've had Steve Kuhn and Michael Schellenberger on Joe Rogan, like we're making all of this progress. But I'd say just one of the things you can do is if you see an individual who's really effective, really promote them as an individual and eventually it's gonna be like people say, oh yeah, there's Al Gore, but there's Alex Epstein and he's way better than Al Gore. Like that's what you want. Al Gore, it's no accident that he's the number one person who popularized climate catastrophism because he embodied this, oh, I'm so concerned about the climate and I researched all the science and I found this out, da 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 And we need to get rid of fossil fuels. And you need, you need really compelling individuals that, that people will learn from. So that's my strategy and I think it's effective. It's just gonna take, you know, a little while. The better owl, the better owl of the two. Yes. Uh, yes. Alex, I was absolutely captivated by your masterclass in PR over the last week with the Washington Post attack. What was happening behind the scenes? Okay, I, I've, I've said a lot about this publicly. So if you just search my Twitter and search like at Washington Post, you'll probably see a lot. And I don't know when people are going to be watching this. But the basic situation is, um, you know, we sent the Washington Post my book. Uh, they responded by sending an outline to my publicist with an article outlining with quotes that instead of engaging my book at all, made this bizarre case that I am a racist based on a total distortion of what I wrote in college. But they actually had some academics who like put their name on this guy as a racist. I can't tell whose they side like they're you. on. They like you. I can't tell. It might be your from fun, the Washington your fun clubs are right. It might be from the Washington Post. <laughs> so like this was, you know, the first thing was I was scared about this and like what is my publisher gonna say and what are what are retailers gonna say and that kind of thing. Um, but I pretty quickly figured out that if you and this is the strategy part of it, if you get a so they, they give a request for comment because they want you to participate in the hit job, right? Because if I comment, they can mangle it or ignore it. And they say, hey, he, we asked him for a comment. And if I don't comment, they can say, hey, we asked him for a comment, he didn't give us a comment. So I knew it was a trap. And I knew I couldn't convince the author because she's trying to destroy me. She's not trying to understand me. You don't dig up somebody's college writings and misinterpret them if you want to understand somebody's current views on energy that are articulated in a book that you're not even willing to read. So what I realized is I can make a preemptive public comment. And so what I did is I made a preemptive public comment. And the key thing I wanted to do was totally like refute the thing beyond any plausibility at all and condemn it 
and call for the just action, which was, and I, not that I thought it would happen, but I thought it should happen, that the journalist in question should be fired, the Post should spike the piece, and they should apologize and reform. Now, what that did is it totally changed the story. The story was going to be Alex Epstein revealed as racist, and instead the story, which got really publicized, became revealed as the Washington Post planning to cancel Alex Epstein and his new book, Fossil Future. And so, among other things, that brought just attention to Fossil Future, which the Washington Post should be bringing attention to. They're journalists. It's a big book. They should be talking about it, not just attacking the author. And, but I think so. That, that, that's the key, the preemptive public comment and doing it really definitively, unapologetically, comprehensively to the point where you change the story from like the story uh, that leads to your cancellation to the story of the totally irrational, unfair attempt at canceling. And so now the story is now the Washington Post tried to cancel Alex Epstein and failed. And they tried to cancel Fossil Future and that'll be good for the book. But had I not played it this way, had I just given them a comment, it's like, I'm not as bad as you think, don't do this. But who knows what people with lower spines uh, would have done. Up next. Are you working at using the war in Ukraine and the ludicrous positions we have of not allowing pipelines and export terminals in the United States that could replace Russia gas to educate people on energy policy? Well, um, I, I, look, I think, I think the, the general context uh, um, is just that the, in, the, inflation is, the inflation is very real and, that's, and that, that should be used on, on every level. You know, I think... Uh, you know, I think it's still somewhat outside the Overton window, but even in Germany, there's, it, it may be possible to reopen the nuclear power discussin. Where, you know, just like this in, insane, insane shooting yourself in the foot and turn out you're shooting yourself in the head and maybe you don't want to do that. But, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, and, and I, I think there's sort of some, a similar set, set of things in, in, in the U.S. where, uh, where you will, you know, it is going to, sh there's some, ability to shift the Overton window on this just because of the, the inflation. It's, it's, you know, it is just a complete reductio ad absurdum of, of, of all this stuff. And it's, you know, manifested, you know, the money doesn't grow on trees. It's, it's you know, this is all the sort of monetary stuff you can, you, can, um, you can educate people on, but then, you know, also about supply and demand and scarcity and how to overcome scarcity. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think it's, it's a huge part of the teachable moment. I'm, if you follow me on Twitter or energytalkingpoints.com, like I'm focused on it a lot. And, and I think it is, it is a really key point to make because it shows just how wrong this view has been that we've been told is the expert view that we can't challenge. And it's gotten us in this terrible situation and it's gotten Europe in a far worse situation. That's a preview of what we could get in if we keep following the bad policies. Alex and Peter, do you think the world would be better served if two great minds like Alex Epstein and Elon Musk engage regularly in public? Not necessarily to annihilate each other in a debate, but to speak intelligently about energy and climate in hopes that there's some common ground that could impact energy policy right away. Peter, how can Alex <laughs> become friends with Elon? Oh, that's, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I think Elon hasn't gotten to where he's gotten without having, you know, a certain look ahead function as to, you know, what the relative uh, gains and losses from such a debate will be. And so uh, it'll be a hard thing to pull off for all the reasons you'd like it to happen. Yeah. What are the three biggest manufacturing industries where you feel the United States should invest its own domestic capabilities over the next 10 years? I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't believe in industrial policy or, or anything that that targeted that but uh but it's just uh it's, it's 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 just you know there should be less less regulation across the board you know and uh and probably you know probably the ones i'd, I'd prior you know the worst ones are the ones where the regulation is the most extreme you know you know energy is certainly um one where it's extremely off uh you know one of the one of the startup companies we invested in was um this um um nuclear um small, uh, these, these modular nuclear uh, fusion reactors, which is sort of much safer design, safe, uh, just got, you know, trashed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And you realize the NRC hasn't approved anything new in, in the 45, 47 years it's been in existence since 1975. They've basically blocked everything. And so NRC's incredibly bad. Um, maybe FDA is even worse. You know, you can go, you can go down all, all the list of these things that are, 
you know, e egregiously, egregiously bad government regulators. I'm going to just add one thing to that, which is that, yeah, I mean, my focus as well is on liberation. So it's definitely not the government decides, oh, I'm going to help this industry. It's liberated. And, and one thing I found promising is a couple of years ago, I decided to focus more on working with elected officials, which people might not think is very promising. But I created this thing called Energy Talking Points. And in particular, a little kind of thing I do called Energy Talking Points on Demand, where we, we give like free messaging and help to different offices. And we work with over 100 different offices now. And what we found is there is a big appetite for good pro-freedom policies but you really have to articulate them and work on them. And so this year we're working on something called the Energy Freedom Platform. And policy number two is decriminalize nuclear energy and like giving a vision for that. And then there's also like a key aspect is liberating mining. That's something where that's key for every industry, including solar and wind insofar as it's economic. And yet we're not doing it. So I, I am heartened. This is another example of where you can't just argue against the bad things. You need a positive alternative. And I found there really is an appetite for a positive alternative. So for example, I gave a talk to my group of, of elected officials. It's mostly staffers, actually. And I gave a talk on like how to decriminalize nuclear. And I had two offices come to me and say, hey, let's work on legislation now. So it really is that, like, it's why I'm optimistic. I think if you really offer positive new things, not just attacks on what's not working, uh, it can really, it, you know, you can get way more than people think is possible. As a fellow student of philosophy of science, I find it aggravating the way that science has been co-opted to drive agendas in the last two years with COVID. Now I see it happening in climate science for similar purposes. Is this something new? Do you see it being used even more going forward? You know, I, I don't think it's particularly new, although it's certainly taken a more intensified form over the last five, 10 years. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I think I think academia has been pretty screwed up for for quite you know for quite a for quite a long time. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Eric, Eric Weinstein, has this riff on it that I, I really like, where um, um, he he says that a lot of institutions have what he calls egos, ego, embedded growth obligations, and uh, the, the for the institution to be healthy, it needs to grow. You know, if you have a if you have a company and the, the company grows, then people can get promoted. They, the wages go up. Uh, the business does well. If it if it's not growing, that that that's sort of a much a much trickier institution to manage. And the um, and then when when institutions shift into a low growth or no gro zero growth mode, um, they have one of two choices. You can you can try to become sort of a much tougher place where you're honest about it. Or um, the much more common choice, um, you can become sociopathic, where you pretend you're still growing when you really aren't. And um, and there's something about um, you know academia. It's 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 sort of a unhealthy zero growth place where um, you have sort of this Malthusian struggle for survival among the academics. And you know if you have if you have uh, 10, uh, 10, 10 people in some um, postgraduate program where um, you know, only one of them will get a job and one person says something slightly politically incorrect, it is a relief to everybody that you can throw the person off the overcrowded bus or whatever. And so I think it's this sort of um, artificial Malthusianism. It's this, uh, this sort of the ways these, um, these institutions that, had, you know, that, that are zero growth institutions that, that have become sociopathic. That's, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the structural feature. And I, th I think, you know, again, I date the transition to, you know, 70s, 80s. It's, 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 I think it's sort of been going on for 40, 50 years, but taken an even more acute turn over the last decade or so. One, one quick point about that is I think it's, it has grown. And it's, it's one of these issues, again, just like the environmental issue, where something bad is succeeding by co-opting something good. So science has this amazing, deservedly positive reputation. And so if you want to enact bad policies that are anti-freedom, like glomming onto science and claiming to own science is very, very effective. And so I think this is another instance where we, can, we should criticize this, but also offer a positive alternative. And I think there's a lot of room for people in science to offer you know, different ways of thinking about science. And one that I've done that's effective, but I don't think comprehensive, is just this idea of full context thinking. And the idea that with any given scientific point, it should be part of the context that we make our decisions with. But as soon as 
quote, the scientists tell us what to do, they are totally violating full context thinking and they're in, engaging in dogmatism. And so one formulation I had in the moral case for fossil fuels is they're acting as you know authorities who dictate versus advisors who explain. And that's another, I think, good alternative is like, do you want to be an authority who dictates or do you want to be an advisor who explains? And that's what scientists should be. And I think the more we have these positive alternatives, so we attack the bad things, but we have something much, much better to offer, I think that's, that's good. And you know, one final example that I, I know Peter and others here are connected to that I've been really impressed by is the Bitcoin movement. You know, I, I, and I've grown up in the free market Ayn Rand world and love that world, and I've been against fiat money forever. But now fiat money, that's being criticized by everybody, like liberals, conservatives, et cetera. People are hostile to the Fed now, which I never thought was possible. But part of it is they invented a real positive alternative, Bitcoin, that is this actual currency that can do things that the government currency can't. And I think that, and you get all of this positive enthusiasm. Now there's also the potential to make money and that gets you a lot of people. And I don't know how to get the same for fossil fuels exactly. But I think it's a sign that when you offer a positive alternative, then your criticism of, that, of the bad things become much more powerful and you can push forward something positive, positive instead of just saying like, oh, woke is bad, ESG is bad and just trying to like stop them or slow them. No, you can actually reverse them if you have a positive alternative. Yeah, one, one, of, the, one of the challenges in doing this with, 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 with science as a, as a field is that, you know, a lot of it has this kind of, um, I don't know, it has this, it's like this monastic character where you're, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, 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 you're working for the state. And, um, and, uh, and you know, I, I've, I've come to, you know, I've come to think, again, I, I think of this maybe too, structurally or sociologically, but I, th I think of a lot of scientists, they're little, like wards of the state. It's like, okay, you're on, you're on welfare and you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be in favor of socialist welfare things because you're getting paid welfare. And that, that's, that's the way to think of most of these scientists. Of course, they're going to be left-wing statists um, because that's, that's, that's the way, that's the, way the, the, the bread is buttered in, in the system. And it's, it, it's probably very hard to even come up with um, you know, with, with alternatives to it because the whole thing is, you know, it, you know, it, it, it grew t to a scale that was, was you know, it's, it doesn't work for the people inside it, but it's, it's sort of very large, it's cancerous, it doesn't work terribly well, but it's this, it's this giant system that just doesn't make, doesn't make sense at that scale, except as this sort of, you know, um, rather bad government program. And so if every time you think of a scientist that it's like, it's, it's just somebody on welfare. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Alex, Peter. Armin, so thanks for hosting this event. I'm curious if, so we had this hour and a half panel, I'm curious if at any time during the panel you felt like, oh, I have a point I want to add and I wanted to give you the chance to add it. Uh, there were quite a few times where I felt like I was going to jump in with something and then one of you guys made the point anyway. So, um, but you know, I think particularly when we were talking about how academia is so self-cannibalizing and how you know, it's this, this tiny non-growing field that has to pretend that it's perpetually growing. Uh, you know, that, that, was, that, that, that was spot on with, with the limited experience I've had on that side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really interested in your answer to the national defense question. So like, how do you see well, yeah, that, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the something. biggest threats to our national defense? Like, that's one reason why I really wanted to talk to you was just yep. like getting your perspective, because I feel aligned with you on that issue, but yep. I don't have anywhere near the concrete knowledge. Well, you mentioned our discussion where I said that energy security is national security. Uh -huh. So like, if we have energy independence, there are all kinds of things that we can do that we cannot do if we don't have energy independence. And you know, there's the tactical side of it. Like we need to have oil to go in the tanks and the boats. And everyone uh -huh. agrees on that. But you also need to have it to be an economic superpower to be able to outcompete everyone. I mean, that's how we beat the Soviet Union, right? You didn't mm -hmm. beat the Soviet Union just by having more weapons. We mm -hmm. economically outcompeted them and made it unviable for them to beat us. Mm -hmm. And so you look at a world where, imagine we do shift all to solar, we shift all to batteries, and we're barely able to scrape by day to day, right? Okay, okay maybe we do that. The question is, what kind of strategic 
situation are you now in relative to bad actors, where you don't have massive strategic energy reserves, you don't have the ability to generate tons of excess power, you don't have the ability to generate massive quantities of oil, not just for yourself, but for partner militaries, for partner nations. Mm -hmm. uh, look at the situation where we're trying to ship oil and natural gas to Europe because we want them to be able to be more independent of Russia. Imagine if we didn't have that capacity. Imagine if the US didn't have oil or natural gas and we're just sitting here with our batteries and our solar saying, well, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're kind of just screwed here. That's how you end up making your decisions, uh, not in terms of what's best, but in terms of, of, of what will allow you to survive. This is why Germany is having to bend over for Russia, right? Mm -hmm. They need to heat German homes so that German people don't freeze to death in the winter. And so they will do whatever Russia wants to the extent it keeps the natural gas flowing. And that's not a position that you want the United States to be in, where we say, we're going to do terrible things, because if we don't, then our horrible energy infrastructure is going to collapse. I mean, one thing with the China also is, so one world is where solar and wind are inefficient and domestic, but that's not the world we live in at all, because right. we're not allowed to mine here, we're not allowed to process here. Right, right, right. So the entire solar wind supply chain is controlled by China. So I mean, knowing what you know about China, how, that scares the hell out of me, and I, I, I think you will make me even more scared. Well, one of the scariest things to me about the supply chain problems with China is that the United States has actually taken such a lax approach to even defining the problem. So, like, yes, we're dependent on China, uh -huh. but if you look at things like what, you know, we have a definition, a legal definition of made in the U.S., right. and it's so easy to get around. So many com companies build products that are made in the United States, mm -hmm. but are hugely critically dependent on Chinese materials, Chinese manufacturing, Chinese processing Chinese everything. Uh -huh. And if China were to cut them off, they would just completely cease to exist. And that's actually one of the things that bothers me the most is like, if you're going to have a government label for something, you mm -hmm. know, like I, this, one of my big pet peeves with the FDA is this label of or certified organic, as, right. if, as if it's a good thing rather than good in some ways worse than others. Like, yes, it's better in some ways maybe, but also it does mean you're more likely to have ex, uh, exposure to certain uh, uh, fungal elements, to certain bacteria. Mm -hmm. Like it's not actually a net all good, right? Uh, or you know, it's not an all good, not thing. consistently good, yeah. And so, you, if the go I don't, I don't think the government should be in the business of even saying, "Hey, here's a marketing label that we're gonna mm -hmm. stamp on things." But if you're going to stamp your marketing label on uh, label like "Made in America," then surely it should actually be something where it's not dependent on on other hostile nations. Uh, what about okay? Chain. So you made this great point about energy security. I'm curious, just so even if we step back from energy, what are the yep. what do you see as like the? I really want your view of the biggest threats to national security, period. Well, I, I, I think the biggest threat to our national security is the United States economy, right? It's the same mm. thing that we saw with the Soviet Union. One of the things I'm most terrified about is not that other people will come up with vastly better weapon systems, which is concerning, or just that they'll come with bio weapons that are better and cheaper. Like, I worry about those things. But mostly I worry that we turn into the Soviet Union where we adopt a political and economic system that makes us fundamentally non-competitive with our strategic adversaries. Mm. And we don't realize it until it's far too late. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Soviets is they realized towards the end that it was not going to work. And, and I, I wonder, you know, when, when is that point for the United States? When do we start to realize that a lot of the decisions we're making on energy policy, manufacturing policy, foreign policy, when are we going to realize that a lot of it is not about making the United States more successful? Uh, but instead kind of just trying to bend over for the right people and be popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to have leaders who are willing to do things that are sometimes unpopular because it's the right thing to do. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about how we've seen this administration backpedaling and saying, oh, you know, oh we, like, you know, we, we need more oil. We need, you know, we, 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 we've never done anything to stop oil. Um, and of course, that's just, that, that, that's, uh, that's not the reality. And actually, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about Elon Musk, but even Elon is saying we need to do more oil and gas production in the near term. Now, right. I disagree with him on a lot of the long term side of right. things, but even, even someone whose entire career is predicated on this idea that, you know, the climate apocalypse is coming, that we have to, that we have to uh, move to all electric, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. Even someone who is very much in that bucket agrees that in the near term, we have to be 
doing more with fossil fuels. So I've, I've always thought that's kind of kind of interesting and not enough people talk about that. Well, it's interesting that like in his case, it was good that he did that. But of course, his long term opposition to fossil fuels is why we have the near term problem. It is true. Place. It is. It is true. Well, it, you know, I, I, so that, I mean, that's it, it is part of it. And I think Look, I, the, 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 I, I'm torn because on the one hand, I like most of the things Elon does. Yeah, I'm torn as well. I really he, like... also, he also is really good at finding the things that are just about to start getting subsidized by the government and then entering those it's businesses. Unbelievable. Which I can't, you know, hey, people, people, people work inside of the systems they're given. One thing that I did want, that I did, that I did hope would get discussed, I don't think it did really get discussed. Mm -hmm. um, it was touched on. You guys touched on this idea that, uh, or at least Peter did, on the idea that Russia has been investing in propaganda for mm -hmm. decades to try and demonize nuclear in the West mm -hmm. because it makes the world, but especially Europe, more dependent on Russian oil and gas. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's actually, it's a, it's a perfect propaganda coup, right? Get the West to self immolate themselves and remove their ability to use the most powerful scientific tool they've ever invented when it comes to energy on purely political grounds. But what, what's crazy is Russia has been doing this for decades. Like, I don't even think it's controversial. They've been engaging in mm -hmm. these efforts for decades to get Europe in particular to distrust nuclear so that they'll buy Russian oil and gas. And then what do we spend all of our time talking about? We spend our time talking about the influence operations that are a thousandth of the size that are in regards to particular elections. Like, right. oh my God, they tried to shift public thinking on this election. Right. Let's talk about it for thousands of hours on right. broadcast television. It's like, well, what about the thousands of times larger effort over the course of decades to brainwash people into thinking that nuclear is more dangerous, that it's more polluting, that it's worse for the environment? And, Nobody, nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about that. This goes to, you know, we're, we both have a little bit of in early interest in journalism and then went on to other things. I think it's so interesting, like, you know, I make this point about we pay so much attention to a polar bear having to move from one piece of ice to another, but three billion people with virtually no electricity, right. nobody cares about it. And it shows you What's how- your point? That is an apocalypse. If yeah. you were living like those people lived, we would consider the apocalypse to have happened already. Right. They're already living the apocalypse. Yeah, and that's not, so it's just- And imagine, so, if we, I mean, if we, imagine if we were living that and someone said, we could end this apocalypse <laughs> by simply using fossil fuels in a managed way. Like you, you'd yeah. be like, oh my God, what an easy way out. Right, and this is why a lot of them, why a lot of them are, but it's interesting how just how much values shape what people report. Because mm -hmm. again, it's like, oh, I'm so interested in this Russian distortion. They're not interested in nuclear. Also on fracking, I think it's obvious that there's been intervention there. Yep. And maybe even more just because they might not be smart enough to, like nuclear is a long-term opposition game. Yep. Uh, whereas fracking is like, this is obvious, this is gonna make us uh, less stable. So uh, I just want to say, like, it's it's so cool to have you, like, your brain engaged in this stuff defending America instead of just playing video games all the time, uh, which I'll I know you, you could do. I'll tell you, it's a lot do. of fun. I mean, working in the games industry is great, too. I tell people all the time, I probably could have made more money and had more fun working in the games industry. And then people say, oh, no, but isn't it really fun working in the military? It's like, no, working on amusement toys is actually really fun. <laughs> like, like, you're basically a modern toy maker. Uh, but it, you're not making as much of a difference, and that's why I'm working in defense. It's not because it's the thing that makes you the happiest. Honestly, it turns you into a little bit of a jaded, cynical person. It burns you up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, you know, we got to have some people who are willing to do that. I'm okay. always, always trying to get more people. More well, people I, I hope help. you wildly succeed at that, and it becomes even more enjoyable. That would be the dream. Oh man, that would be the dream. That'd be so good. Well, hopefully it becomes enjoyable so that I can uh, convince more people to get into the defense space. I can't make it sound all bad, you know? Oh, Awesome, man. Thanks Thank for talking. Thank you so much for coming. This is great. Thanks for having us.